Mother Russia. The Russia of the little father in Moscow. The Russia of Turgenev, Tolstoy, Chekhov. Represented a time and a way of life that have long since passed. Changes vast as the country itself have transformed the land. In the second decade of the 20th century, revolution ended the Tsarist dynasty and set up a new autocracy, destined to become one of the most authoritarian ruling powers in history, the Communist Party. Mother Russia became the heartland of a communist-created empire, known today as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. The Soviet Union now occupies one-sixth of the Earth's surface. It is several times larger than the United States. And because of its immense economic potential, its great military strength, and hostile political ideology, a knowledge of the land and its peoples is important for any strategic evaluation of the country. Based on climate and vegetation, the USSR includes four main types of terrain, tundra, forest, steppe, and desert. Frigid tundra borders the Soviet Arctic region. Below the tundra, the forests form an almost uninterrupted belt from Russia's European border to the Soviet Pacific coast. Moving south, a region of mixed forests and agricultural lands, below which lie the vast grain-producing plains and steppe lands. Still further to the south are the deserts of Soviet Central Asia. Along much of the Soviet European border, there are fewer obstacles. However, the Pripyat marshes, boglands, and forests present local impediments. Along the southern border, the mountains of the Caucasus, Pamir, and Altai separate the Soviet Union from Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and the western provinces of China. The Ural Mountains, running north and south, divide European Russia from Soviet Asia. The physical features of the land tend to retard and channelize military movement. Any campaign in Russia must also anticipate the extremes of climate which have helped write her history. The long, cold Russian winter, as Napoleon and Hitler discovered, is not conducive to travel. In the northern parts of the country, long shadows in the cold months make observation difficult. Spring is short, cool, cloudy, and wet. The mud of the spring rainy season slows down or hinders ground operations. In a country so vast and varied in climate and terrain, transportation has always been a problem. A comparatively small percentage of the nation's bulk goods is moved on the rivers, which with few exceptions run north and south. The principal river is the Volga. Development of a system of inland waterways linking the Volga with other river systems and the neighboring oceans has greatly aided commercial traffic. Ports on the Baltic and Black Seas and on the Arctic and Pacific Oceans provide key points for the movement of Soviet goods. About 85% of all traffic moves by the Soviet railway. 
Though this great dependence on railroads proved to be a weakness in World War II when the Germans knocked out key rail lines, the Russians showed remarkable ability in repairing the lines and moving tremendous volumes of traffic over them. The broad gauge tracks on Soviet rail lines, wider than the standard track used in Europe, makes it necessary to transload freight for shipment across Russia's borders. Currently, the Soviet Union has about one-fourth of U.S. track coverage. Tracks have been laid in the Turkmen area and in other remote sections in a continuing attempt to link the far-flung Soviet provinces. Certain areas of the Soviet railway need modernization. Progress has been made in the building of new facilities. There are only a few hard surface highways suitable for continuous military traffic. Highway mileage in the entire country is less than 10% as dense as that of the United States. Numerous dirt roads and tracks are passable only in good weather. Nerve center of the Soviet Union, containing 80% of the population and more than 80% of the productive economy, lies in a roughly triangular area which extends from the western boundary to western Siberia. More than half of the nation's labor power is absorbed by agriculture. Peculiar to the Soviet economy are the collective farms. In the collectivist system, the state owns the land and controls distribution of its products. The object of agricultural collectivization was to extend state controls to this branch of the economy and make machine farming practical by combining many small holdings, thus increasing productivity. It has not yet produced the results hoped for by the Soviet planners because of diversion of men workers into industrial production and lack of incentive in tilling land, which has no personal identification for the worker. During the 1930s, enforced collectivization of the farms often resulted in neglect and abandonment of the land by resistant workers and subsequent famine. Today, large numbers of women are employed in heavy agricultural activity on the collective farms. Russia is one of the world's great producers of wheat principal export item in pre-Soviet days. Wheat production is centered in the Ukraine, while other forms of grain predominate in different areas of the country. Agricultural products include tobacco, apples, berries, and a variety of other fruits and vegetables. Even the sunflower is used in the making of oils for home and industry. Depending on availability of equipment, agricultural methods are either extremely primitive or fairly modern. Many of the large tractors used on Soviet farms are full tracked and convertible to military usage. The livestock industry in the Soviet Union is insufficient for the country's needs. Great efforts are being made to increase production. Enough dairy farming is carried on to supply local demand. After the state has taken its share, the farm workers are paid in produce, 
and cash equivalent. According to the degree of skill their jobs require, the amount of work they perform, and the yield from their labors. Thus, an unskilled laborer will receive only one-fourth the income of a technician. Agricultural research is accented in ever-increasing attempts to make the land yield more. Major emphasis in the Soviet economy is on development of resources for industrial production. Russia has always had vast mineral wealth, a rich variety of metals, iron ore, copper, lead, tin, zinc, and gold. Coal resources are more than adequate. Ingenious methods have been devised to speed up work, such as frequent competitions to boost production incentive among the miners of the various coal-producing regions. Key Soviet industrial areas are centered around Leningrad, Moscow, Kiev, Kharkov, and Sverdlovsk. Planned dispersion of industry has long been a part of Soviet economic policy. This movement was accelerated during World War II when the German invasion caused many Russian plants to be moved to the Euros. Since 1928, the Soviet Union has shifted the weight of its productive energy into heavy industry, more readily convertible to military production. Total pig iron production in Russia is about one half of that of the United States. Steel production is about two-fifths of our steel output. While total United States industrial production is about four to one over the Soviet Union, the amount of Russian industrial goods channeled to the military is much greater in proportion than in the United States. Though Soviet steel production is far below ours, she manufactures only about one-fifth as many lighter industrial products. This means that only a small proportion of her steel goes into consumer goods. Most of the steel is utilized in further industrial expansion and in military production. An important facet of the Soviet economy is textile manufacturing. Formerly, wool and flax were the principal materials for the textile trade. The nation has increased its resources substantially in the textile field through intensive development of the cotton industry. Oil production is increasingly supplementing coal as a power source for Soviet industry. Before World War II, oil production was concentrated in the Caucasian area and particularly at Baku on the Caspian Sea.
New oil fields have been located and the industry developed in an area between the Volga River and the Ural Mountains, considerably lessening the strategic significance of the Caucasian oil fields. Present oil output is sufficient to cover domestic needs and to export token quantities. The country's many waterways have great hydroelectric potential. Hydroelectric power is becoming an important energy source through construction and development of giant plants in strategic areas. Comparatively little electricity is brought to the home of the worker on the farm or in the city. Plants are designed essentially to power the wheels of heavy industry. Extensive fishing activity is carried on in the Baltic, Black and Caspian Seas and in the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. The country has tremendous resources of timber. Because of their accessibility, the forests of European Russia have been ruthlessly depleted in an attempt to satisfy the demands of Soviet industry. The difficulties of climate and the problem of transporting logs in remote areas make lumbering in the northern Asiatic forests a complicated operation. Attempts have been made to collectivize the hardy Arctic trappers who provide the Soviet states with valuable hides, a valuable item in the nation's export trade. The complex of peoples who make the Soviet economy productive is as vast and varied as the land itself. The population divides itself into several broad categories. An upper bureaucracy includes important Communist Party members. High army officers and leading members of industry, science and the arts. Activities of this group are centered around Moscow. Ironically, the concept of an elite group in the population is directly opposed to the doctrine of a classless society on which the present Soviet state was founded. The elite group is backed up by a growing class of skilled technicians in key sectors of the economy. The great majority of Soviet peoples is made up of laborers, peasants and farm workers who comprise the major portion of the population. Among this group, working hours are long, but their standard of living is being improved and hours shortened. Over 170 ethnic groups populate the Soviet Empire. The largest group is the Slavs, which include the Great Russians, whose traditional home was centered around Moscow, the White Russians, who inhabit Soviet Bielorussia, and the Ukrainians, who live in the Soviet Ukraine. The rest of the total is made up of numerous smaller groups. The Caucasus is the home of a multitude of tribes. In the regions bordering the Arctic are Eskimos and Finno-Ugrians. In Soviet Asia, Kazakhs, Mongols, Turkmens, and other nomadic peoples are found.
Wherever he may live, the Soviet citizen is generally vigorous, accustomed to hardship, and capable of great endurance. All religious beliefs are condemned by communist doctrine, and the ultimate goal is their destruction. Meanwhile, the Soviet rulers are utilizing the Orthodox Church as a means of propaganda. This is also true of other religions which have been allowed to exist. Education is an important factor in Soviet indoctrination policy. A select group of children is trained to form the nucleus of a future army officers corps. Throughout her history, Russia has always tended to form an elite military group. Higher education inevitably accents scientific and technological training in agriculture and industry. Graduates are assigned to these fields for their first five years of working experience. All of the natural resources of the country and means of production are owned by the state and operated by the government. In its attempt to exploit its facilities to the maximum degree, the state has empowered factory heads to impose severe penalties on workers for being absent or late, for minor infractions of rules, and for alleged negligence in care of state property. Trade unions in Russia have lost their ability to represent the proper interests of labor. Their status has been reduced to the supervision of social services planned and authorized by the state. A common form of punishment in the Soviet Union is forced labor. The number of people in labor camps has been estimated at from two to 20 million. The victims have included resistors of the collectivization drives of the 1930s, deportees from the Baltic states, national minorities, political deviants, and others. Slave labor, which has been an important factor in the economy, has been on the decrease since Stalin's death. It has been said that in a gathering of three Russians, one will be an MVD, or secret police agent. Whether or not this is true, a dictatorial control of the government, the people, industry, agriculture, even culture, seems to be absolute. The Communist Party itself has about 8 million members in a total population of over 200 million. But within the ranks of the party are included all essential personnel, all leadership in every phase of Soviet life. In the past, the loyalty of the people to the regime could not be depended upon. When the Nazis invaded Russia in World War II, a part of the Soviet population received them as liberators. The government found it necessary during the conflict to appeal to their ancestral love of their homeland. Since the war, Soviet leadership has been rooting out sources of discontent. Disaffected minority groups were moved to Siberia and Central Asia. The new generation, which has grown to adulthood knowing only communism, and its slant of history and world affairs are probably loyal supporters of their government. Today, the strength of the Soviet Union lies in the hardiness of her people. And in a powerful armed force backed up by rapidly expanding industrial might and increasing technical skill. lies in inadequate transportation and communication, 
insufficient food production for her growing population, the rigidities of a state-managed economy, the restrictions of the communist ideology on the life and activities of its citizens, and the ever-present threat of a power struggle among its leaders. The Soviet balance sheet is a long and complex one. Only future events can total the score.